All right, welcome back. 755 Forever. I'm David O'Brien, race writer at The Athletic. This is 755 Forever. And I'm with my co-host, as usual, Eric O'Flady, former Breeze Believer. What's up, Eric? How you doing, man? Not much. I'm pretty good. How you doing, Dave? Great, man. It was a, uh, what an eventful weekend at the yard. Braves took the last two of the three-game series with the Phillies. All-Stars were named today with uh, Chris Sale, Ronaldo Lopez, and Marcelo Zuna, which the three I knew would get in, I, pr- I was pretty sure, because since Lopez leads in ERA, leads the major seed ERA, Sale leads, he was a he was a slam dunk, he leads in win, yep. wins, uh, leads the league in win, majors in win. And Ozuna, even though the fans voted in Otani, I think Schwarber had a – you knew he was going to get in with the numbers he had. They would make him. They'd make it work. So uh, the only one that I thought might get in was Max Freed. I think that last start might have hurt him because he got blown up. Um, I don't know if the votes were already in or how they select the, all the reserves, but those giving up eleven hits in that last uh, that game on Friday uh, could not have helped if they were waiting till the end. Uh, and his number, other numbers were kind of borderline compared to say the ten, twelve guys who statistically, if you took the whole batch yeah. of stats, were a little ahead. So that was a little tougher one to justify just because, I mean, he, he's just been as good. He's been a top five pitcher in the league since those ter- first two starts. But those count, of course, they kind of drag it down. But uh, And then Chavez. I thought Jesse had a chance. I still think he has a chance. I think he and Free both have a chance because you know how this last week and a half, there's going to be five guys probably drop out, either that are hurt or – there'll be several guys pitching next weekend that won't be eligible to pitch in the All-Star game on Tuesday. One of those will be Chris Sale. He's not going to be able to pitch in it because he's going to pitch two times more. One at Arizona in this series starts tomorrow, and then once at San Diego next weekend. So he won't be able to pitch in the game. So he could be replaced by one of his, by Chavez or Freed. Yeah, we'll see. It's like I think I said it last episode, but it's very hard to make an All-Star team as a reliever, you know, unless you're a closer. Yeah. He's done great, but you just don't get – you just don't get the recognition for how important that role is, and it usually just goes to another closer if they were going to take another reliever. If they did, it would be one of those where they make an exception before fan, you know, for the fan popularity of a guy. Jesse's got a chance, not just because he's forty and he's got great numbers, but he's pitched for. If you think about it, so many teams that yeah. he's a guy that league might look at it as well. Oakland can say, "Oh, he's one of ours," because he started for Oakland for a couple of years. So that might be an easy way for them to make some other teams feel better represented. But who knows? We'll see. Before I get going any further about the real highlight of the weekend, let me just say embrace country and all over baseball. It's the middle of the season. Time for the All-Star break. There's an, there's another break worth taking. That would be a coffee break to remember Braves legend Henry Aaron, who was selected for the Midsummer Classic over 20 times for the National League and one more time for the AL at the end of his career. Joe Van Gogh Coffee is bringing back blend number 44 in honor of Aaron, the all-time Braves all-star. For a limited time, find our blend number 44 at JoeVanGogh.com and enter the code HAMMER at checkout to receive an additional 20% off your purchase. Joe Van Gogh has been roasting, serving coffee for 30 years and following the Braves through each and every one of them. Joe, uh, Visit JoeVanGogh.com. That's J-O-E-V-A-N-G-O-G-H. Dot com And just in case it's too hot for you, blend number 44 makes a great cold brew as well. The highlight of the weekend, the highlight of the year, hands down, Bobby Cox showing up at the game last night. I'm, this is only the second time since he had his massive stroke in 2019, first week of the season, that he's been to the ballpark. And one of the other, the only other time was in 2020 when the pandemic, when the place was empty and he sat in McGurk's Sweet and watch the game with the with no crowd there. So this was really the first time most Braves fans have seen him since the stroke. And I told you, I think we discussed this one time. I said if Bobby comes back, when Bobby comes back, it'll be the most thunderous ovation. Uh that and Soroka, I thought would be, but Soroka got kind of sidetracked along the way and didn't work out that way. Bobby was the every bit of what I thought it would be. And it was even cooler because it was unannounced. We had no idea he was going to be there. They tap, It was on a Friday night. They timed it right because it was the Phillies. Friday night, they sell out, you know, all their weekend games pretty much anyway. But it was a sold-out crowd with fireworks that night. Delayed about 20 minutes, so everybody was there. 
when they did it between innings, they showed Bobby and the PA and a guy in tone, the greatest manager of all time, our beloved number six, Bobby Kahn. And he stood in the suite where he was sitting with Pam there, McGurk there, and some other, some little kids, I think it was his grandkids, and waved with his left hand because his right hand, his arm is paralyzed. He waved with his left hand. And that place was, I looked around and I saw people literally wiping tears. It was, it was, it was something, man. Yeah, that's, I mean, he's probably my favorite ber- baseball person ever. That What he did for me in my career, just like, I think I've told the story before, but coming over and handing me his shoes, literally gave me the shoes off his feet and I have them in my closet still. Tell that uh, story come, again for people that might not have listened that time. Um, so, you know, I had a 20-something ERA with Seattle the year before and it was a pretty old school clubhouse. Um, you're kind of supposed to, you know, be a rookie and stay out of the way. At Seattle. Um, in Seattle, yeah. So I came over to Atlanta kind of expecting more of the same and expecting to just be nobody. And I had a 20 ERA. I'd been put on waivers. They got me for free, um, kind of a scrap heap pickup, you know. And I go to sit down in my locker. I'm just going to be quiet. I'm not going to talk to anybody. And Bobby himself comes up and sits at my locker. And he says to me, we're so excited to have you. You know, we tried to get you a few times. I couldn't believe you were on waivers. Can't wait to see what you can do. And that for me was like, Bobby knows who I am. I expected to just be some guy that throws a few spring innings and goes to Gwinnett or maybe gets released. And just that right there gave me so much confidence. And this was during uh, Camp Roger when all the guys would come down and throw early preseason. And so I go through the whole workout and then finish up and it's time to shower. I realize I forgot shower shoes. And you know Bill Akery. Uh, yeah, yeah. Bill's great. I love him. But if you don't know Bill or you haven't earned your place yet, <laughs> yeah. you better not ask Bill for shit. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I asked a few guys, I'm like, where do I get shower shoes? And they're kind of like, yeah, go ask Bill. See how that goes. <laughs> so I walk into Bill's office and I just say, you know, Mr. Acre, I, I need some shower shoes. I, I forgot mine. And he just looks at me and he's about to just bite my head off. <laughs> You know, that's, I mean, that's just his style. <laughs> yeah. He would, he would have given them to me, but right. I would have gotten worn out and right. yada, yada, yada. And Bobby sees that come and stands up, takes the shower shoes off his feet, hands them to me. He goes, here you go. Get out of here, kiddo. And so when I came back in the locker room, everybody was like wanting to hear the story of how bad, you know, Bill wore me out. And I just showed him Bobby's shoes that he gave me. And that right there, like just that part about him is just he treated every single player Like they belonged. He never said anything negative. He pumped you up. He always told you, you know, he always had your back and he always encouraged you. And it was just a completely different atmosphere than I'd been in before. And it it boosted my confidence. It made me feel comfortable right away. And you could see the numbers from when I was in Seattle to when I came to Atlanta, how much that meant. So, yeah, he means a lot to me. So you've got a shower shoe still. Do they have number six scrawled on them? Yeah. Yeah, I'd have to go. I have to go pull them out there. It, they probably it's probably pretty uh, washed down, but yeah, I still got them. You know, it wasn't just players too. I mean, obviously, every player called him the ultimate players manager, who always had your back. Back in the day, when a manager, when you could get something out of fighting with umpires, now you can't even do that. You're tossed immediately, and there's not much point in doing it because they're not changing a call. Or they're not, you know, the the uh, strike zone is. You know, umpires use the. Uh, are graded on the strike zone and they go to replay if you argue a cause. So you just, you know, uh, object to it or, or challenge it. You don't go out and fight about it, you know. Well, back in the day, Bobby, the, you could fight if you wanted to. And Bobby, of course, I think people know, got ejected way more than any other manager in history. He got ejected a full season's worth of ejections, like 160 some. And at times he did it not even sure of the call that he was arguing. <laughs> Just so his either his player would not yep. get ejected, yep, or just to show that he had his players back. I mean that that great story about him asking, uh, what was he asked Glavin about whether it was close or something, and Glav asked asked Maddox and, and Maddox said no, and he, he said go ask Maddox. And Maddox said yeah, they were. <laughs> and he, just, <laughs> he just wanted to see Bobby go out there and get in a fight when the <laughs> pitchers were charting pitches, you know, like they used to. Yeah, there's just so many great stories like that. But not only was it players though. But that's the way that that was the uh, that was the uniqueness of Bobby and his in his personality that was just uh, he was one of a kind was how he treated everybody, everybody in every ballpark from the time he walked into the went and drove into the parking lot, the parking attendants to the guys security 
the sky caps at the hotel. Everybody knew him. If he'd been there once or twice, everybody knew who he was because he was so nice to everybody. Remembered names, tipped everybody. I mean, he was just everybody loves the guy. Everybody. Yep. Including umpires. Everybody. I mean, yeah, I'm sure he'd get up in their face and then he'd see him the next day and act right. like nothing happened. See him after but the game, act, you know. It, it's see him a, at a hard bar thing back to. In the day. It's really hard to explain to people, too, what, unless you've interacted with the guy and, and felt that, you know, how important he makes you feel because he makes everybody feel important. And it's not an easy thing to do. And it takes a lot of energy. You know, it, it, when everybody knows yeah. you to go around and be nice right. to every single person nonstop, whether you're having a good or a bad day, it takes a lot of energy. And he never broke character. It was he, he treated every single person he interacted with like that. It's hard too, and and because you know that if that one person, if you're having a shitty day, and that one person gets you right when you've just gotten an argument yep. or whatever, or you just were told it's got some bad news or whatever, and one person asks for the autograph and you turn them down, that person's going to go, you know, especially in the age of social media at the end of Bobby's career, and say, I tried to get Bobby, he, he snapped at me, but you never saw that because he didn't do that nope. to anybody. Nope. So yeah. he just loved people for one thing. He really likes people. He likes talking to people. He likes hearing. And it makes it's genuine. It doesn't come across as phony like he's just trying to schmooze with you. It comes across as he really cares. He asks you where you're from. He mentions somebody he used to play there, whatever. It's just the way he was. But so anyway, since we all feared the worst after 2019, because he nearly died from that stroke. I mean, there's some stories about it that I haven't even written that some of it's like, I don't know how much we can write or something, but but let's just say he came very really close. I mean, it happened in his house and he was alone. And he had to pretty much drag himself next door to survive and knock on somebody's door, dragging himself. I mean, it was I, I never heard that. It was bad. It was bad. But that is one tough dude because they thought a couple of years ago, when it, what, three years ago, maybe when he moved from the rehab center to home, it was pretty much, you know, hospice. And... He was diagnosed with congenitive heart disease. Usually you don't live too long with that. And here he is now feeling good enough to, you know, he went on vacation with Pam down to the island where the house they have down in, in Florida by Jacksonville, Amelia. And uh, and now he's at the ballpark. And uh, Kevin McAlpin's kid plays Little League, and he was shocked like uh, two months ago. He goes to his son's Little League game, and Bobby, who lives near there, was at the Little League Park because Bobby's grandkid, I think, was playing. And Bobby was sitting in a wheelchair behind the bat- behind the batter's box, or I mean behind a batting cage, behind a screen, watching the game. And McCallum was like, oh, my God, because nobody had seen them out, you know. And the kids, he got he got pictures with the Little League, Little League players and stuff. And Snit took him down. Snit took him down to clubhouse yesterday before the game because Snit, you know, just worships the guy. I mean, he's his mentor, his close friend, his former boss. I mean, he taught Snit everything he knows about managing, basically, and about being a good guy. Uh, I'm Snit's a good guy too, but just the way that he treats players and stuff. But uh, anyway, Snit took him. But Snit was so thrilled that he was at the park, and he just had to bring him to the clubhouse before the game. The only guys in there that even knew him that played when Bobby managed were Charlie and Jesse that knew him from from playing, you know, playing with the Braves when 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 he was still around. And they've also all obviously gone and played for like three, four other teams and come back. But uh, he met all these guys. He knows, Stitt said he knows all the players when, you know, because he can say some words now. He's saying, Stitt said he's saying a few more words than he than he was saying. But like I said, his eyes lit up when Chris Sale came in and knew exactly who he was. Oh, he's right up Bobby's alley. Uh, yes, yes. He would have been Bobby's favorite. Ozzy came in. And he said, Ozzy, Ozzy, uh, keep, you know, keep keep playing hard. And he, and he said something to Riley. He said, oh, he could pick it, something like that, this it said. So he knows all the players. And most of them, as Olsen said, if they don't know him, then shame on them because he's he is the Braves, you know. He's an institution. And Olsen grew up here in Atlanta watching him skipper those teams. So Olsen was thrilled. He shook his hand and said, you're a legend. Yep, he is. I mean, the 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 word the best word I could describe him is just magical. I mean, it's almost like not a real human. The guy was was just so special. Larger than life. Larger than life. Having him and Hank, because yeah, Hank was like that too. Their, their presence oh, yeah. and just the way they make people feel is just you don't run into many people like that in your life. Icon is overused, but it definitely applied to Hank and and to Bobby. I mean, yep, Hall of Famers, but. 
just so identified with an organization, you know? So anyway, that was a thrill to have him out there. I was so glad I was there. I mean, cause they didn't announce it. We didn't know he was going to be there. So I'm just so glad I was there. Cause it was, uh, it was pretty damn awesome. How do you get ready for a day game after a night game? A superb cup of coffee or two or three is a great way to start. Or for me, six. Joe Van Gogh Coffee suggests blend number 44, so named in remembrance of Hall of Famer and Braves legend Henry Aaron. For a limited time, find our blend number 44 at jovengo.com and enter the code HAMMER at checkout to receive an additional 20% off your purchase. That's pretty damn good, man. Joe Van Gogh has been roasting and serving coffee for 30 years and following the Braves through each and every one of them. Visit JoeVanGogh.com, just like it sounds, Joe Van Gogh, J-O-E-V-A-N-G-O-G-H.com. So the Braves take two and really showed some sign. That I, I think the fans were ready to jump off a, a, the, a cliff, a bridge, on Friday night when they lost, uh, what, six to four? No, eight to six, eight to six. Yeah, because they scored six runs and still lost because Max had his first bat out in a while. Hit three home runs and still lost that game. The fans are like, that's it. This team sucks. Ten games behind again. Sell. They got to get rid of trade Maxway. All that just stuff, you know, that crap online. Um, you try to tell me they're not selling. Period. End of story. They're not trading Max. Move on. So they came back the next two nights and beat the Phillies. Schwellenbach pitched outstanding last night, Saturday night. Pitched great. Best start of his career. He had a similar start against the Tigers, but this was against the Phillies. And even without, you know, Harper and, and Real Muto and, Sch- and Schwarber in there, that's still a tough lineup. Trey Turner, that's still a start. That's a damn good lineup. And he pitched great against them. Uh, six innings, one run, seven hits. Throwing strikes, just pounding the strike zone. Had 81 pitches, 60 strikes. Yeah, that's what you have to do against them, too, because they're one of those lineups that feeds off each other. Once they get going, they're hard to stop. But if you shut them down and attack them, I mean, I, I think if you keep them from getting any momentum and and keep getting ahead in the counts, really the only way to beat them. Ken did a note that's going to be in his in his notes. Ken Rosenthal did a note that's going to be in his notes column in the morning about um, – the really impressive thing about Schwellenbach, and we've talked about just how polished he is for a guy who's pitched so little because he pitched like he pitched in high school. Then he didn't pitch in, in his first uh, two years at Nebraska. It was just a shortstop. And he had Tommy, he had, he had elbow surgery early in Nebraska oh, after high school. It wasn't Tommy John. It was another elbow surgery after COVID. He's in college after COVID, his arm's getting healthy, you know, playing shortstop and not pitch. And he called his coach and said he wanted to pitch. And the coach said, all right, let's work this in. And he got, so he closed his last year there and played short and was damn good shortstop. And so he's all American and closed his senior year, his junior year. So the only pitching he had done was that, that one year above high school was that. And like a hundred innings now, a hundred, less than a hundred innings in the minors. And he's out there pitching now in the majors, and he's kind of wrapped up that fifth spot for now because he's the only one that's really stepped up and looks ready for the challenge every time out. I mean, he's he looks it's, he's got great presence. He throws strikes. He just throws strikes, and the other guys have trouble with that, and they get off track, walk the yard, and he doesn't do that. It's uh, he's impressive, and he's got like a five pitch repertoire, and he uses all of them. Well, I think a huge advantage for him and- is that he hit in college. Oh, he's so good out you know, there. I mean, Fielding you, his position. Well, you might not be learning how to pitch when right. you're hitting, but you're learning I what sucks you. to hit, you yeah. know? So I think that's always – I always thought the guys just had better a better feel and idea for what sequencing was and what was hard to hit and what made a pitch good when they'd face tough pitching. When you If you've hit in high school, yeah. I mean, like who knows who you hit off and if they could execute pitches or not. But if you play at a, a – a, Pretty good college, like a D1 yeah. big-time college. You're facing pitchers that are throwing really nasty stuff at you, and so you know what what's hard to get to, where your bat is, what what's confusing for a hitter, uh, yeah. where where the outs are. So I think there's that's still, if you want to talk about like not pitching for that long, I think that's a big difference between like a high school guy that kind of started pitching late yeah. Yeah. and a college guy that was in the box seeing what seeing what it looks like and then knowing that you're throwing the same thing. Like the difference between him and Smith Sharver. Right. That's what I'm who saying. Who only pitched in high school. 
Yep. Texas, just chunking it by people, started at the end of his high school career and played travel ball, but he didn't have to work on pitches and anything like that. And uh, and this guy's just got a, a great aptitude for it. I mean, you talk to him, and it takes 10 seconds to understand that this guy's different than most of these yeah. kids. He's 24, for one thing, but he's mature, and he's yeah. down to earth. He's un- He doesn't get excited, and he's just really calm. I've got the note now that Ken wrote for tomorrow that's coming out. And Ken wrote, said, you want to see something stunning? Spencer Schwellenbach's pitch breakdown Saturday night when he allowed one run six innings against the Phillies. The mix was all the more impressive considering it was only his seventh major league start. Four seam fastball, 17 of them. 16 splitters, 14 sliders, 14 curveballs, 13 sinkers, seven cutters. I'm sorry, six pitch repertoire, not five. Yeah, and that's what I think a lot of the each time through the order stuff stems from too. Yeah. You know, it, 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 he can get deep into a game and right. you might have an at-bat. If he has six pitches, you can have an at-bat where you don't see four of them. Yeah. You know, break but, out more when you, need to, when you need them. Yeah, yeah. Ken wrote, he's shown remarkable aptitude since joining the Braves on May 29, adding a sinker, tweaking grips on all three of his fastballs and moving from the third base side to the middle of the rubber. He's had no choice but to learn on the job after throwing only 110 innings in the minors and 31 and two-thirds innings at Nebraska. He added the sinker since he's been up because he started throwing that in the offseason, and the minor league guys told him, no, nah, I don't throw that right now because they wanted him to focus on the pitches he had. Yeah. That, you know, and, that, and that's, not a, that's not a mistake by the minor league pitchers. They just wanted him to focus on what he had so he could make the jump and, and progress rather than trying to do everything. But now that he got up here – the pitching coaches with the Braves told him, you know, when when he said he, he's got a sinker and the catchers here, that, that was a big one. The two catchers here told him that sinker can come in handy. You can use yeah. that at this level to get, you know, to get guys out from one side or the other. So that's when he picked it up and he hadn't even thrown it in game until he threw it in a major league game. Well, I mean, it just seems Orioles. like one of those feel guys to me, the guys yeah. that are good at everything. There's certain guys that just they they get a feel for things so fast. You know, they pick up golf. They're they got a four handicap in a year. You know, they they go play ping pong. They beat everybody. There's certain guys like that that just have this ability to to feel certain things and pick it up really really fast. And I bet you he's one of those guys. So he volunteered. He he told his coach in, that in college he wanted to pitch and to let him pitch that ju- that's the junior year. And he closed. He had a 057 ERA and 31 two thirds innings as closer. Uh, his coach said, his coach at Nebraska, he said, uh, I feel, I still think he saw pitching as a hobby. We were pretty giddy with excitement over his stuff and command. It was effortless. He looked like a big leaguer right away, honestly. He said some clubs still loved him as a shortstop and hitter. He was a truly p- plus defender with a 70 arm on the 20 to 80 scale. Nobody has 70, you know, in anything. What he's done is incredible with so little experience as a pitcher for us in, in the minor leagues. His mind separate his mindset is a separator. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's what it is, honestly. I mean, one thing that I'll talk to people a lot and they'll just think that, well, you got lucky, you got this good left arm and that got you to the major leagues. But that's not what separates you. You know, you get drafted with back when I got drafted, now it's probably ninety seven miles an hour, but when I got right. drafted, you get drafted with fifteen pitchers that throw ninety three. Yeah. And yeah. it's it, 15 pitchers with a good slider. And so how do you separate yourself when it, it's all up here? And, uh, you know, it'll piss you off when people don't want to give you credit because you're like, I found a way to separate myself up yeah. top. You know, I didn't ha- just have this raw ability. And the guys that can come up and, and pick up on pitching, like th- this is insane, honestly, to only be pitching 110 innings. And, and 30 be, in college. And be pitching like this in the major leagues is – Right. It, it's not normal. And he pitched really well too against big teams. Yeah, against ball at Baltimore, against the Phillies. I mean, yeah, it's crazy. You have these other guys come up here and they get shell shocked, and they might fool the guys one or two times through the order, and then they just get lit up, you know. Yep. Or they get scrambled and start walking guys, and 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 can't throw strikes. And he's just had no moments like that. It's been really impressive. I'm one of these. I'm one of these. I know there's some difference of opinions on because obviously talent and having a golden arm is the number one thing for yeah. a pitcher. You got to be able to throw. But I'm one of these guys that really thinks having a great intellect, having the kind of feel, is one thing, and that's so important. But I also think that goes with having the aptitude and yeah, and, and intelligence. Sure. But having that intellect, I think there's a reason why you talk to the really great, great 
pitchers. Not many of them come across as dumb. You know, no, maybe a closer. You know, right. fastball slider. We're talking but, starters, yeah, yeah. Starting no, they're pitchers. sharp. Yeah, your legendary pitchers. You talk to them, even their old age, they're still sharp. Those my, but you talk to you know Greg Maddox and Tom Glavin and just the guys I've co- you know I've covered a lot here and John Smoltz. I mean, and when I was with uh, covered when I was covering the Marlins, Al Leiter, you know, Kevin Brown. Not the nicest guy, but smart. <laughs> but you talk to these guys, and and they're sharp. And I think that, you know, you can be a good pitcher and not obviously not be a real smart guy, I don't think. But I think it really helps the guys. As he said, it's that separator, you know, aptitude, intelligence, intellect, whatever you want to call it. I think it all kind of comes together. But this guy's got that. He's got that. And Spencer Strider, another perfect example. One of the sharpest guys, Max Freed, super smart guy, you know. Uh, Charlie Morton, really smart guy. Chris Sale. These guys are really smart. Ronaldo Lopez. You could tell, even though he's a translator, I can't hear him speak directly, but the translation, his, he's a really thoughtful guy. Yeah. So that's the difference that I think it, it, it's not a coincidence at all. I agree. Injury report coming up next. It's brought to you by Gerber and Holder, attorneys who only represent injured workers, sponsoring this injury report, just like these Braves. If you've been hurt on the job, go to www.gerberholderlaw.com. Today's trivia question, Bobby Cox has the most ejections by any MLB manager in history at a very fitting number of 162. Who is second place all time? Email us at 755foreverpodcast at gmail.com. Now back to the show. Injury report. We got, uh, you got Ian Anderson and Smith Strauber making their way back, prog- progressing, which could be big, especially Ian Anderson, I think, because he's looked good in his, uh, in his rehab start so far. That would be a real nice guy at the back when there's because they want to still give these guys extra rest that means working in a guy bringing up a guy from the minors optional guys using six starters at times and i think ian anderson would be a great one back because they've gotten out uh uh schmellenbach has got one of those spots down now but you're going to have something's going to these guys aren't going to go through the whole second half of the season none of them without having some ache or pain and need to skip a start or go on the il for 15 days and no, it's not the end of the world if it happens. It could it could be anything, you know? We've seen that every year. So far, the big three guys have avoided it. But chances are it's going to happen. And, and it could be Charlie, you know? Charlie's had something go wrong, whether it's just a small thing. But anyway, it'd be nice to have. I still think they need to go out and trade for a, a, an innings eater, a real reliable guy, back of the rotation guy. But it'll be nice to have Ian Anderson as an option. And Smith Sharver as well. Has he pitched again? Ian? Yeah, how many times has he pitched? Uh, I think his second one's, I want to say tomorrow at, at high A. He pitched really well in that first one at uh, in A ball. The injury report, I'm sorry, is brought to you by Gerber and Holder, attorneys who only represent injured workers. Just like these braids, if you've been hurt on the job, go to www.gerberholderlaw.com. G-E-R-B-E-R-H-O-L-D-E-R-Law.com. The injury report, guys. Uh, Michael Harris has running now. He's not sprinting full bore yet, so he's still got a ways. They're being real careful with him, and I'm still saying after the All-Star break, so they've got this close to it. I, I don't see any reason why they would send him out before that. Um, but he's but he's, but he's had no setbacks, making progress. He's out there running, said he doesn't feel anything, so that's big. Um, the way Kelnick's played in center and let leading off, I don't think you move Kelnick out of leadoff at all. I don't think there's any question you leave him a leadoff. No, I, I, mean, it, I mean, if it's going well, don't. I mean, if ain't broke, don't fix it. Right. And as great as he has played center, Kelnick's look great out there. You don't move Harris because that's what he's played his whole career. He's a center fielder. He's, a, yeah. you know, he's no, he's the guy. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's unless you didn't want him to have to run around as much when he initially comes back from the thing, but they're not going to bring it back till he's 100%. So yeah, I think it's the, easier to go from left to center than center to left because those yeah. balls that are sliced. Yeah. Agreed. And the angles out there on the corner spots, those are something you have to get used to. And it seems like, I don't know if I've ever heard of Harris playing anywhere but center. Right, he hasn't. I mean, you're not moving him, period. I'm not even suggesting you do. But I, but I know some people are going to look at these catches Kelnick's made and go, oh, man, leave him there. But Kelnick, you can move to right field and – And Harris might have caught those balls standing up. Right. And right field, you've got a, you know, tricky with the bricks and all that. He's nice to have out there. He's got a great arm. 
going to have a hell of an outfielder when he gets back, especially if you uh, especially if you make a trade at the deadline for a platoon guy with Duvall. I'll tell you what, though, big, the other thing, really encouraging this weekend, Duvall, who was like the shittiest hitter against right-handers all year, had three hits in the series <laughs> against righties, including he crushed a – dude, he crushed a right-handed homer yesterday. Yeah, yeah. 40 degree launch angle, 420 some feet, second deck up there in that Henry Aaron Terrace. Destroyed it off a righty. So that's a good sign because he was awful. He was hitting like 80, 080 against righties this year. It was yeah, brutal. Was, he, had a, he had a rough stretch either last year or the year before where he looked, he looked a little lost too. But when he yeah. gets hot. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And especially if you got him in a platoon, just hitting lefties. Yeah. I mean, b- before he had to start playing every day when they could platoon him, he was hitting, like, he had a 900 OPS against lefties. Yeah. He was raking against lefties. So, whatever they decide to do, I, I think they need that depth anyway, because we've seen this week when you're having to run guys out there like Forrest Wall, Eli White's up. Eli White hit a home run today, his first mm-hmm. of the season. He, after having that six for seven game in Triple A, that kind of got their attention and they brought him up, sent Forrest Wall down. Because all Forrest was doing was trying to bunt, you know, and it wasn't really. So Eli White, we'll see what he does. But he had a he had a, he had his first home run today, that game at uh, St. Paul last week, six for seven, two doubles, two homers, seven RBIs. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. How about how about Triple A Gwinnett playing, have been in St. Paul, Minnesota for a week? They do those six game series, you know, but that yes. travel. The way AAA these travel is the worst. The way they're spread out now, it's insane. The Pacific Coast League, remember, I don't know what the alignment is now, but they had games where, like, team in, up in Seattle up with you is traveling to, like, yeah, I played New for Orleans. Tacoma. Yeah. Like, going to New Orleans and Memphis. Yeah. Triple yeah. A. <laughs> At morning flight. Day, Commercial. Get, how about this? You get you play a game at 7 o'clock at night. Game ends. You got a 4 a.m. flight. So you get back to the hotel, or not a 4 a.m. flight, but you got a 4 a.m. bus to the airport, 6 a.m. flight, fly whatever, three or four hours to wherever you're going, lose time because you're changing time zones, right. get in straight to the park game oh, that night. That's brutal. Like that, it is the worst. Like That's the reason to get out of there is, is just to have a chance to be at your best because – there were times where you could, you were just thrilled if you could get a little hour power nap in before you had to be at the park. And some managers were different. Some wanted to get the work in, but I mean, getting up at three thirty, four a.m. to try to get on a bus, go to get on the flight, fly, wait for your bags. Like I remember, we we were in uh, Colorado Springs or something, but I think we flew into Denver and drove. Got to the hotel straight to the park. BP's in an hour. It's the worst. Dude, I do that kind of travel, but I'm not playing a game exactly. when I get there. It's all I can do <laughs> yeah. is caffeinate with a five-hour energy, four or five yeah. cups of coffee, an energy drink. And I'm still a zombie trying to transcribe. I can barely stay awake. If I had yeah. to go out and play, go hit do 96. anything. Fi- oh, my <laughs> God. I don't know how you do it. Especially the teams, the AAA teams playing out there and traveling east. At least when you're here going, going west, you you're gaining hours. Yeah. Right. And if you could sleep on a plane – you're in business, but when you're coming back and losing, oh my God, straight to the ballpark from a commercial and they're flying commercial. These people that think, you know, oh, no, Mason, Southwest get commercial. I saw Barry Zito in the middle seat on a Southwest flight with probably 200 million in the bank. And I was <laughs> like, Barry, <laughs> what are you doing, man? I mean, he's just doing it for the love of the game. He wanted right. to come back. He wanted to play one more year and see what he had in the tank, but yeah, yeah. I mean, the guy made all the money he made, and <laughs> Southwest it doesn't matter how much time you got in the big leagues. It's that's the boarding pay, order. <laughs> the most you can do is spend fifty dollars to board early. <laughs> yep, seventy five or whatever it is now. <laughs> People still sitting right next to you. Zeno's probably like, "How about if I give you a million? How? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he could have chartered his own planes that whole year if yeah. they would have let him. But <laughs> that wouldn't be too great for team morale. He could have got no. like five or six of the guys on a, on one of the private jets up. <laughs> the only move you could make was to try to you know take a taxi to the airport and beat everybody there and try to uh, upgrade. Because some of those flights, if they have first class seats open, you could upgrade to first class for like 150 bucks or something. Yeah, oh, that was a game changer. You might be able to fall asleep, but yeah, I've never been able to sleep. You know, between or next to strangers. Oh God, yeah. I, I 
Yeah, I, I could, if I couldn't sleep on planes, I'd be dead, man, because I, I procrastinate packing and end up getting two or three hours sleep most of the time when I'm flying early. So anyway, yeah, that's a different world, man. I talked to Holmes about that. Grant Holmes, he's pitched great, man, since he got here, by yeah. the way. He's yeah. pitched great. And mm-hmm. and But I talked to him about it. I said, after 10 years of bus rides and commercial flights, Peanut he was out and, in the, and he was out in the West Coast a lot, too, with it, yep. when he was with Oakland and L.A., he was in those places, Stockton and places like that, and uh, but uh, in Oregon. But I said, man, when you're here now, is it everything you'd hoped for? And he goes, oh yeah, he says it's even better. You know, the accommodations, the hotels, the flights. He goes, I guess it'd be really hard to go back after you've been here. And he goes, I want to end my career here. And he goes, but you never know what's going to happen. I know I'm not going to give up. Whatever happens. So he's fully. He knows how to options that at any time, even if he's pitching great. He could get caught in numbers crunch and get sent back down. So it's not going to crush him if he does, but he's shown that he wants to show enough while he's here. And he has that they'll have him back up here as soon as they can make a move. So, but I don't see him sending him down anytime soon because he's so valuable as a long guy. You know, he's uh what a story he is. Yeah. You go from, I remember we were in uh, Frisco was, I think it was Frisco. And we were saying that this dumpy hotel that didn't have AC AC was broke and they were like, they were giving us fans. So you go from that, just smelling your sweaty roommate to you're in the big leagues in New York city and you got your own hotel room. AC Carlton. You're at the Ritz or the four the, seasons. The, yeah. You're at the, that's probably the, the biggest, the best part about getting called up to the big leagues. You get your own room on the road. And you're making that money. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it's just so different. Jesus Christ, what's two doing? different worlds, and and the skill gap isn't isn't that big, but it is. Right. To stay is tough, and you ain't carrying your own bags, and they're picking you up and taking you straight to the plane. You're not going inside like we do and check it. You're you're going straight to the plane and on. That's why anybody anybody that's uh, been in the big leagues for a significant amount of time and hits that rough patch in their career and has to go down and grind, I respect the shit out of it because. That is, it, it's such a drop off from everything that happens for you and it, every, your laundry, like every single thing is taken care of for of for you in the big leagues. And then you go down and it's like you're eating peanut butter and jelly and you got to figure it out yourself. Yeah, it's so funny. It's like the guys that don't the guys who have the money to buy the stuff, you don't have to buy anything out when you get up to the big leagues. Nope. You know? Yeah. <laughs> no, it's free stuff everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Beats Beats by Dre's here today. Here's some free headphones. Right. And you they just to land to... in your locker. Right. And I saw a few of those the other day that were like somebody dropped off boxes of them. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember when those came out. I remember when those came out, you guys had them like every one of you had them in the locker. Somebody got them for you. Yep. Yeah. And that stuff just keeps happening. And then you go down to the miners and it's 20 bucks a day meal money and hang with them. Until some big leaguer comes down on rehab and buys, buys you out food. back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this episode is brought to you by Joe Van Gogh Coffee. Joe Van Gogh is back in the fold in Braves country and all over baseball. It's the middle of the season. Time for the all-star break. There's another break worth taking. That would be a coffee break to remember Braves legend Henry Aaron, who was selected in Midsummer Classic 20 times. Joe Van Gogh Coffee is bringing back blend number 44. There you go. All right, well, the Braves certainly needed that. You know, they've won four out of six. They've won both series against the Phillies this year because they got them in the first week of the season, and they got them now. And the Phillies, of course, are playing without a few of their guys. But the Braves are playing without a few of their guys, too. All year. two that ain't coming back, Strider and yeah. Acuna. You know, I was talking to Ozuna about that, too. He goes, yeah, they're playing without, you know, they're playing without Harper and Schwarber and Real Muto. He goes, but those guys are coming back soon. Two of ours aren't coming back, you know. Yeah. But Ozuna was great. He said, you know. I talked to him about this. I, I'm going to write it, but uh, I talked to him about the uh, what we've talked about this, you know, while they while they obviously want to win the division and they're busting ass to try to win the division. They know that it hasn't worked going in with that five days off. It's not that they're, scary. The worst thing in the world is not going in as a wild card and being able to keep playing and have that momentum and not have to sit around. For, it's like... It's like catch-22. You want to win the division, obviously. You want to rest your pitchers, but nobody wants to sit around again for five days. And that's part of – you can't have one without the other. So as long as they are in the wild card, 
they're going to be the Braves are going to feel confident about what they can do if they just get to the get to the postseason healthy. They know what they can do, what they're capable of doing, even if they hadn't shown for much of the season. Well, I mean, it's just it makes it's made me lose some interest in the regular season because you look at the postseason, you're like, look at the teams that went deep last year. Look at the right, two wild cards the, in the NL. The teams that win a hundred games were out in the first round, and well, not the first, but they're out in the their first round. You know, their the first, first series they Dodgers lose. And and, Braves, two years and, in a row. And you watch this happen, and it's like, yeah. I'm not scared to be a wild card. Ah, it's who gets hot and who's healthy. Who's and healthy not to mention, again. yeah, healthy is huge, but yeah. hot bats really, I think. But oh, yeah. not to mention too, you know, like it, I don't care how long you've played, everybody gets a little jittery that that first couple playoff games. Everybody does, no matter how long you've played. Like you talk to veterans, they're all a little jittery on opening day and they're all a little jittery for the playoffs. Well, you get to play against a team that's jittery too. Well, that first round after they've already got they've already got that out and they're playing and they've already won a series and they're confident and feeling good coming into with some momentum. And now you got to be the team with the jitters playing the team that already kind of got rid of it. Yeah, and a guy like Ronaldo Lopez, he hadn't been in a postseason, you know. He'd like to, I wouldn't hurt him to start the game in a wild card series and get that out of the way before you go into the next round. So, anyway, it's going to be interesting. Braves have got a one week road trip going into the All Star break. They got four in oven like Phoenix, where it was 115 today. Oh, it's a nice that, day there. <laughs> that that roof shut will be nice. And then they got three in San Diego. So, uh, Need to play well, and because that's a tough road trip. I mean, those are two good teams, especially at home. And go into this thing because you 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 had gotten it down to what six and a half games, I think. Then it got back up to ten after you lost Friday. Now you got it at eight, and you gone head to head, and you know what you can do with them head to head and all that. So they need to win. You know, go four and three on this road trip would be nice for them. You know, win both. They can do that, and then you go. Uh, I, and and as much as I'm sure people would like to see Sale pitch in the All Star game, I, I I don't think the Braves are are minding at all that he's scheduled to pitch next weekend because they do not need him tweaking something or trying to but you know because he's going to go all out if he's in there for one inning he's going to yeah, air he's it gonna out 102 <laughs> right and yeah. they don't need him doing that in his competitive because it'll be his first All Star game since 2018 he went to seven straight but he hadn't been in six years yeah but he's. I bet he's good on pitching, and I yeah. don't think he needs to. A lot, a lot of guys that have done a few of them would rather have the time off. Right, right. He pitched two innings in the 2017 All-Star game, back when they used to do that. He pitched the first two innings and struck out Ozuna at the end of the second inning. Did he? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, it's pretty cool. He's known, Ozuna has known uh, Lopez since Lopez was coming up. Because they live near, kind of near each other in Dominican. And he ran into him at the 2016, I think it was, All-Star game when, when Lopez was there in the Futures game. And uh, Azuna was there for the Home Run Derby, I think, that year. Anyway, he ran into him. They went out because they were both from the Dominican. And he called him like a uh, well, young, fresh, but a, a Spanish translation for that. And, he, and he's always called him that. And then they ended up together, you know, this year when he comes over from the White Sox. So they're really tight. And they they go to each other's houses now in the Dominican. So and now they're going to that All Star game together. And it's for Azuna. It's his first one since he went to back to back ones when he was with the Marlins. So they all, though, all three of those guys really have have taken have have overcome some things, you know. And Lopez is a reliever for the last two plus years. So pretty cool. Those three, eight All Stars last year, three totally different ones this year. None of them repeated. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you could, you know, it's funny though because you could look at the numbers at the end of a season and think, why wasn't this guy or why right. wasn't that guy? You know, it's so much right. of it is determined in those first two months. And oh yeah, if Free didn't have a few bad starts, he's an all star again. Oh yeah, it's, and he might still be, but yeah, he absolutely. That's like the year, uh, both the year that Chipper won MVP and the year Terry Pendleton won MVP. Neither one of them was in the All Star game. Yeah, isn't that yeah. crazy? Yeah. So, all right. We'll talk again to you guys. Appreciate uh, you watching us and uh, subscribing and all that. And I hope you guys enjoyed those games. And I hope everybody got to see Bobby. That game was on uh, Fox. So hopefully a lot of people saw it because it was, it was a moment, man. 
All right, 755 forever. We are out. Appreciate it, everybody. I am McCole Hartman, wide receiver for the NFL. Speeding, it's a rush on the field in the zone where it matters. As an athlete, I push my limits to win, but when I get behind the wheel, I know the importance of slowing down for safety because speeding is illegal. It endangers you, your loved ones, and everyone else on the road. Did you know speeding accounts for more than one quarter of all traffic-related fatalities nationwide? Just like we need to focus to score touchdowns and win games, we need to be in the zone to stay safe on the road. Speed limits are in place to protect everyone. No matter what the speed limit is, anything over is not only illegal, but dangerous. Like athletes, drivers must stay alert and present because there is no reward for speeding. Nothing is safe about it. Driving over the speed limit might seem like the quicker option, but speeding catches up with you. Stay focused, and in a split second, everything can change. Paid for by NHTSA.